So welcome to the first student talk. It is by a student from CMI. <laughs> <laughs> so in case you don't know, his name is Rohan <laughs> and he's in third year. And since he's a student of CMI, he will give a talk on <laughs> random. He will give a random talk on random things. I have a mic. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ananya. So I'll give a random talk on randomized computation. Okay. So this will tell you that my handwriting is horrible and that you should move forward if you want to read what's going on. Genuinely, move forward. You won't be able to understand what's going on otherwise. Okay, uh, so how many you have of you have seen any probability before? Like uh, high school probability, tossing a coin, anything? You guys haven't? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're familiar with some amount of probability. Okay, uh, so any probability that I'll be dealing with today is anyway discrete, uh, and there'll be finitely many objects, and the probability is just like, probability of an event is just the number of good outcomes upon number of total outcomes. That is all I mean by probability. That's fine. Do you all understand some amount of conditional probability? Okay. Sure. Base theorem. That works. Okay. So that is all I need today. Any of you who has seen randomized computation before doing algorithms that have some amount of randomness? Sure. Yeah, okay. Some people. Great. Aditi also has, amazingly, after taking courses as well. Uh, okay. So the idea will be, I want to show you one algorithm. And if we have time, maybe we'll look at two algorithms for some problem. So the problem I want to talk about today is the min cut problem. So do you all know what a cut is? Okay, do you all know what a graph is? Anybody who doesn't? Okay, so my graph that I will care about is an undirected graph on some vertices, some edges, okay? A cut is just a partition of this V into two parts. So a cut, is some partition. This is just disjoint union, such that S union T is equal to V. Okay, this is a cut. So now what do I mean by the size of a cut? If I have to define the minimum of something, I need to define the size, right? So the size of this cut is just the number of edges going from S to T. So size S union T, I am defining to be number of E such that E is in, I don't know, E of S comma T. E is equal to S comma T where S is in S, T is in T. So just pictorially, I def d uh, divide my V into S and T, and just these number of edges that are going across is the size of this cut, okay? So the min cut problem, given a graph G union G, like with vertices and edges, find the size of the minimum cut, okay? The smallest cut. Does the problem make sense? So given G, find smallest cut. Uh, 
Okay. So I am assuming S and T are non empty. See, I told you. <laughs> so S and T are non empty. Uh, okay. So one silly, can you give me some bound on what the cut size could be? Lowest degree is a bound because you could S could just be a single vertex. So if I take the minimum degree vertex, the cut has to be smaller than the minimum degree. Does everyone agree? But that does not need to be the case, right? Can someone think of an example where that's not the case? Good. So I'll just take K3s. So my graph is this. Uh, and I have each vertex clearly has degree at least two. Okay, my nodes are one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so my degree is at least two. Minimum degree is two, but the cut size is just one. Does it make sense? So this is not good. So how do I find such a cut given a graph? How can I come up with an algorithm? Do any of you know some algorithm for this already? Oh, nobody. Great. Other than say nobody does, so it's great. And Aditi doesn't count. Yeah, so, and one hint is the algorithm should be randomized. So try to work it out. Like this is going to be more you working out things as well, unlike the other talks. The algorithm that we'll find will be randomized. So we'll we don't we'll say that with probability ninety nine percent, I'll give you the min cut. My algorithm will run and it will toss some coins, and it will find some cut. And with probability ninety nine percent, I want to be sure that it's the min cut. Does that make sense? Okay. And okay, what kind of algorithm? Okay, can you give me a stupid algorithm? Okay, so one a stupid algorithm that is not randomized. This is the stupidest thing one can do. Great. Check every possible cut. Brute force. Then he is like, okay, let's not do that. For every particular size of the cut, like one word, like size of the sets. So size one set, I'll pick some random size one sets and see if something is good. Pick some random size two subsets and see if something is good. That's the kind of thing you're doing. Why would that be good? For example, here the min cut comes from size 3. Right? In general, this would have been size, let's say, I could have taken a 2n vertex graph and put a kn here, take an n edge, put an kn here. Yeah? So now the only min cut of size 1 is this edge. Like you have to divide it into exactly this part. So the probability that you get that when you pick a random n size set. Yeah, yeah. so you will get it only when you are you are at n size sets, right? So when you're at n size sets, the probability that you'll get it is one by two n choose n. That is very bad. We don't want that kind of probability. And even if you repeat this a lot of times, you'll have to do exponentially many times you'll have to go. And this will even end up being worse than just checking everything. It won't, but close enough. OK. Hmm. So we can't do that. But it's a good idea.
because otherwise I can move it across. Okay. And then how how do you repeat? Uh, but like that, we agreed, right? Might not be the. Yes. So yes, that is a good idea. But I want the minimum. You can give so with some probability. I don't want an approximation of the minimum. I just want the minimum. Otherwise, the min cut is zero. Yes. And connectivity, you can check. Yeah, I mean, you can just speak. You don't need to raise your hand anything. Just speak. I see what you mean, but how do you do that? Like, how do you figure out what to merge, what not to merge? Because at the end, if you keep repeating this, you're left with all the vertices individually. And now you have to just merge them. Do you see what you, I mean? And you like, it just reduces to the same problem, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, but like, uh, my minimum cut size doesn't need to be one. My minimum cut, so I could have something like, okay, and now I have to delete both the edges and nothing is connected to less than equal to three things. Does that make sense? So even I can't do that, like the cut size could be very big. The cut size doesn't need to be a small thing. The minimum cut size might be as large as, I don't know, any, like if this is, let's say n click, n click, then even n minus two edges I could send across and it would still be fine. Okay. You are checking if there's a one size cut, like a cut and okay. How will you check that just for class? Yeah. How? Oh. Okay. Okay. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. I agree. This is good, but this is only good if you have only if you are sure that your cut will be of size at most ten, then you can do this. But if I don't give you any such guarantee, even if it's like as soon as I can I do not give you a constant size guarantee, this algorithm doesn't work. Because it's dependent on the cut size of the cut. Your size of the cut is kind of in the exponent, right? So that's not good. You don't want anything like that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that does, but your actual minimum cut doesn't need to be the minimum. When I break it into these particular components, the two components don't need to be the minimum cuts in those respective things. No, 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 no. So what I'm trying to say is, if I have this graph, this is your initial attempt, right? Then you find somehow the recursively the min cut here and recursively the min cut here. Then you're saying merge this and this, merge this and this, merge this and this, merge this and this, and try all of these, right? 
yeah okay or just this or just that or just this or just that but the problem is this might be the main cut in just this graph this might be the main cut in just this graph but when i put both together the mid main cut might turn up like something completely different do you see what i mean mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no no could you repeat could you repeat sorry uh-huh uh-huh Uh-huh. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay, let me try to give you an example of... Okay, try to think of an example why that wouldn't be good. Fair enough. That's an idea. Okay. So the idea is the kind of ridiculous thing. So I'll move a little ahead, okay? So the idea is this ridiculous thing here that, okay, let's say we were in this graph. If I pick a random edge, okay? Right now there's only one, the size of the cut is just one. So if I pick a random edge, what is the probability that it is the cut edge? No, no, if I pick a random edge, one in the number of edges, right? The point is the, the cut edge, picking the cut edge is a very low probability event because the cut edge should be very sparse. It should not take a high portion of your edges, right? Yeah, in this case, I'm just taking a single edge. I'll talk about uh, multiple edges situation soon. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm. Uh, no, see, that is kind of specific to the situation I gave you, right? I want a thing that works for any graph, regardless. I want a way to think about it that works regardless of what the graph is. Does it make sense? That's why every time somebody tells me I try to come up with a different graph where it won't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. So the point was that if I pick a random, let's say my cut size is just one. So if I just pick a random edge, then the probability that it was my cut edge is very low. Okay, that's all I use. So what I will do is say in this graph, pick a random edge. So let's say a random edge was this edge. Then I take these two vertices, make them into one vertex. How I do that? So this vertex becomes two vertices, right? So this was already there, but now I'm merging this here. So I'll add another extra edge here. I'll add one extra edge that was going there. I'll add this extra edge. This stays here. This, this, this. This is the situation I end up in. So I pick a random edge merge the vertices into one and adjust all the edges. So this, I pick this random edge. I combine these. Then this edge became this one. The edge here disappeared because I merged it into one. So you can keep this here but it merged into one, so that's gone. And this edge I kept, okay? 
do you understand what I did? So I remove, I merge these edges, remove the self loops, and that's it. And I repeat this. I repeat this till I have two vertices. I say that's my partition. Always. That's my algorithm. That's all I do. So on this side, I'll like this vertex would have come from a bunch of vertices. The other vertex would have come from merging a bunch of vertices. My final answer is the ones that were merged here, the ones that were merged here. That's it. Uniformly random edge. The two vertices I'm both edges will disappear. My algorithm is just you pick a uniformly random edge. I do not say how to choose that edge, except uniformly random, not the one between maximum degree or anything like that. A uniformly random edge. Yes, kind of. Yes. So what I did is completely random, right? So maybe in the first step, I just merged these. I could have merged these in the second step. I could have merged these in the third step. And at every step, there was a probability that it goes away. But I'm saying with some sufficient amount of probability, this edge will still be left. Huh? How high is it? Mm -hmm. It's it's increasing. You tell me how much is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then I don't know how to analyze it. Then I don't know what is the probability that my cut is left. If you can make that work, I would be very happy to see how that works. The only way I know how to make this work is just pick a uniform the random edge. Huh? Sad. Very sad. I give you the wrong answer in that situation. Yeah, we can think about how to do this, but okay. Do you understand the the thing that I'm doing? Does everyone understand that? Should any does anyone believe that this can possibly be good? <laughs> See, okay. Yes, exactly. So that I'll come to. The point is, okay, with what probability do you think that this cut will survive? Is one by why? That that's great. I I uh, that. Mm -hmm. But it could be multiple edges going across, right? Maybe the min cut size was three. And if I cut off, like if I merge any of those three, it's bad. Like my min cut size could be n, n minus two, let's say. And if I merge any of them, it's bad. So you have to give a more general argument. To find the minimum cut, the size cut with high probability. So my initial algorithm is just this, because I felt like if I pick a random edge, this won't go away now. And I just kept on with that idea. That's all I was like. Okay. So let's try to analyze this. 
So my minimum cut size, let's say min cut is equal to C. This is the size of the min cut. Okay, C edges. So how many edges are there in the graph initially? If the min cut is size C, at least how many edges? Totally agree. You all said something in the beginning. Good. Implies edges is greater than or equal to nc by 2. OK? So if I pick a random edge, what is the probability that my it was one of my cut edges? It is less than or equal to 2 over n. OK? Probability uh, random edge is in cut, in min cut. Yeah, do you agree? So the probability that all my min cut edges survive the first step is how much? So probability all survive first step greater than or equal to n minus 2 by n. Okay, let's say they survive first step, all of them. Then what is the probability they survive the second step as well? Given that they survive the first step. Now there are n minus one vertices. It is still the min cut. Great. So the next if probability survive all survive. Yeah, but like the point is it's still the min cut in the new graph. Right? So the probability, the number of edges in the graph is at least n minus 1 into c by 2. So the, my probability of this cut edge st still surviving is 2, like any of these being chosen is 2 by n minus 1. So all of them surviving is n minus 3 by n minus 1. Survive second step. n minus 3 over n minus 1 into this, n minus 2 by n, OK? Because they should survive the first step, and then they should survive the second step, Bayes theorem. Yeah? OK, and I just keep doing this. Probability that they survive the n minus second step, survive n minus 2. greater than or equal to n minus 3 into n minus 2 all the way to 1, n minus 1 into n minus 2 all the way up to 3. Yeah, is greater than or equal to 2 by n into n minus 1. So with probability at least 2 by n square, my min cut survives. Oh, this quantity is exactly. OK, this is what I care about. With probability at least 2 by n square, my min cut survives. So what I do is I do this process n square times and pick the lowest amongst these cuts. And the probability will improve each step. That in none, so let's say the probability, I'll go to this side. So this algorithm working in one iteration is probability two by n square, okay? Uh, and then what my new algorithm is, let's call this algorithm Carger one, okay. This algorithm is Carger one, okay. So Carger K, I'll just say 
repeat Kargar one k times. Times take best. Okay. Each of them will give me some cut size. And I just take the best amongst all of these. Okay. What is the probability that this works? Great. So it is one minus two by n square to the k. Okay. So you're like one minus all of this. Okay. So how much is this roughly? Kind of. Yes, but so what he's saying is what I'll approximate one by two n square. I can approximate this. You have to take my word for it. Is one minus this number I'll ap approximate as uh I just want an upper bound, right? So here the one by n square to the k. Okay. So if my k is let's say hundred n square, then my algorithm will work with probability k by n square here. 1 minus e to the 100. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. That's a better bound, but then it's not precise because e to the minus 1 by n square is slightly bigger. One minus e to the minus 1 by 2 n square is slightly bigger than the You get the spirit. Huh, e to the minus 1 by n square. E to the minus 1 by n square. Yeah, anyway, you get the spirit. Okay. So my algorithm now is working with probability 1 minus. So if I had just done this instead of 100 n square, if I had just gone with 100 n square log n, let's say. Yeah. So then this is 100 log n. So this is greater than or equal to 1 by 1 by n to the 100. So my ridiculous algorithm of just deleting, like just merging a random edge works with great probability. <laughs> OK? Time, okay, each step takes, I don't know, order, let's say, number of edges time to pick a random edge. It takes order log m actually, but it doesn't matter. Let's say order log n here, doing the computation, another n log n, and this is some n cube or n to the four. So it's not great, it's not the best that I want, but I have done something absolutely stupid and gotten a good run time somehow. Does everybody understand kind of what happened here? Okay. So the other amazing thing this gives me is what is the probability of a particular, this was not just some min cut service. There could be many min cuts, right? There doesn't need to be one min cut. So this tells me that the min cut I had in mind, the probability that that survives is two by n square. So that means that there are not more than n square by two min cuts. Because then the probability that like one of them survives is two by n square. The probability that some, at least one of them survives will be more than one. I think so, yeah. He was asking me something like this. Yes. 
So in that means that a graph has no more than n choose two min cuts. No, I, I don't know any other proof of this. So. <laughs> huh? So probability of a particular min cut Oh, edges is at least nc by 2. Min cut is size c. So every vertex has degree at least c. That's it. That's the first argument, first thing I asked you, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's it. That's the algorithm. Now, okay. I want, here, what did I do? I've, went on till the very end. So one question that he asked is how do I improve the runtime? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. No. Why? Number of, uh, number of cuts is two to the n because it's any subset of No, this is just the number, the min cut is of a particular size, right? I'm saying the, the min cut is of size C, okay? But there could be many ways of cutting C edges that work. I'm telling you there are at most n choose two ways of cutting the C edges. The silly bound will be n choose C or something. Like n choose n by two is the worst that we give you. I'm saying there are at most n choose two ways of cutting the right edges. Yeah, tell me. Oh, I thought, sorry. Okay, does that make sense? Does that make some amount of sense? Okay. So this tells me, okay, there are two ways I can go. I can try to do something with this probabilistic argument. And right now we counted as well, right? The at most the number of edges. So I can go in that direction or I can go in like improving the runtime direction. This choice I give you. Runtime? Yeah, it won't be a great improvement by the way. It will, I'll just improve this algorithm a bit. I'm, I'll still do random edge picking thing. Okay, sure. Um, right. So now I asked what is the number of cuts of size exactly the min cut, right? What is the number of cuts of size at most twice? Okay, this this not n choose two necessarily because uh, you could have picked either direction. So it's actually n square minus n if I count s and t as different. If you want to do that distinction, it's n, n square or n into n minus one. Okay. So that you can see if you want to keep that distinction or not. Anyway, so now I ask how many cuts are there of size at most twice into the main cut? Yeah. So right now there are the main cut is size C. So how many cuts are there which have size at most two C? What was that number? <laughs> I mean, for C, like, what? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was just confused. And yeah. Yeah, we do the same thing. We just run this algorithm, but we stop a little early because if like the cut is si twice the size of the main cut, it won't, we won't, it won't necessarily survive the last time. Okay, so what happens now? Random edge in main uh, probability, oh, I didn't write. Yeah, so if the random edge in 
alpha times min cut is how much? Two alpha by n. No, no, no. I mean, that that can't be true because if I put uh, c like instead of two c, I start talking about n c. Then it could be any cut. Kind of, almost. Do you see what I mean? Like it should have some function of the x because it should tend towards the uh, actual thing, right? The number of cuts. If I just allow larger and larger cuts, does that make sense? Are you just why stop guessing? <laughs> Okay, so the prob random edge survives min cut. What's the probability? Two alpha by n. So I can here it will become one minus two alpha by n, and I keep doing till what point can I do? Like for the first two n minus two alpha steps, I can do. I have to stop at the point there are two alpha things left. Yeah. Then what do I do once there are two alpha things left? So what I will get this way is. It will be n into n minus one, n minus two alpha, or two alpha plus one. Hmm? Two alpha plus one is it? Okay, I'll I'll take your word for it. No, just two alpha. Just two alpha. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. Upon n minus two alpha. Up to one. Yeah. So how much is this? Hmm? Ah, yes. To the minus one. <laughs> <laughs> so how much is this? This is n choose two alpha, right? Now what do I do? I have two alpha vertices left. Pick a random subset. <laughs> One by two to the alpha more. Two to the two alpha. I had two alpha le vertices left, right? So just pick a random subset. This also one by. Okay. So my min cut surviving the first n minus two alpha steps, the probability is one by n choose two alpha. Now how do I like now there is like it's one of these min cuts, right? So I said okay, there are two to the alpha possible two to the two alpha possibilities. I just pick a random one. So how much is this? N choose two alpha into two to the two alpha. No, the next step is zero. Next step is zero. I can't do that. Like if I have two alpha vertices, prob size of cut being less than or equal to two alpha, I don't know. I cut the edge with probability one, right? So this is greater than or equal to one by n to the two alpha. Just because two alpha factorial is greater than two to the two alpha. The point is, there are if I just look at twice into the size of the min cut, there are at most n to the four. Like you can find a better thing by just analyzing this a little better. But there are at most one n to the four cuts. Like there are at most n to the four cuts. Which are at most twice the size. 
ridiculous argument for it. <laughs> I'm doing probability on this train structure where I'm just like, oh, I see an edge, merge it. And hope that it does not cut off your edges. But do you see the spirit of what happened here? Okay, how much time do I have? 25 minutes. Okay, so. Okay, so doubts about this. Then I'll show you some different type of thing just for like, so that you don't, I show you some other ridiculous thing, but not this type of thing. Any doubts? All right, okay. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is primality testing. Given a number, check if it is prime. Have you all heard of primality testing? Okay, have any of you heard of primality testing? Okay, have you heard of randomized uh, primality testing? I heard, I thought you had not seen any randomized algorithms. Okay, anyway. So primality testing, how do, uh, what is the problem from the name? Great, amazing kid. He understands everything. Uh, so I give you a, if I give you a number, you tell me if it is a prime. How can I do this? Oh, by the way, this algorithm is called Karger's algorithm. He came up with this amazing thing in 93, I think, something like that, 1993. And that's the only way I think we know how to count the number of cuts. Yeah. Karger, I think, so there's an immediate improvement that you can do. So the idea is right now, why is the probability very bad? The probability is very bad because at later steps, it's degenerating very fast, right? So I should not give that much weight to the later steps. So I repeat the later steps more instead of repeating the earlier steps as well. So let's say I can do the first n by two steps, then I can divide into two iterations. Do n by four more steps, divide into two more iterations, each part. And this will grow the size a bit, but this is still like size does not grow and you can do each of these computations. And the drop is not the, as bad because you're going through all of them. That's the idea. So that can improve to n cube, n square, I don't know what the exact thing is. But that gives a huge improvement already. And is a very nice idea to know. Okay, so primality testing. So how many of you have done some number theory, some modular arithmetic, mod p for, okay, let me rephrase. How many of you know Fermat's little theorem? Okay. Don't need to know. If you know, great. If you don't know, no problem. So Fermat's little theorem tells you that mod p a to the p minus one is congruent to one mod p for a comma p equal to one. GCD of a comma p is one. If p does not divide a, then if I take the p minus one at power of a, this is one. Okay. This you take on faith from me. This is Fermat's little theorem. This I'll not prove right now. Easy to prove, you can ask me later if you want to know. So primality testing. I told you Fermat's little theorem. How do you check if a number I have given you is prime? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, great idea. But is it possible for some pri non prime to also have this property? Maybe some there, there's some prime number which is not a prime. 
which also has this property. So I want to do something that is only true for primes. This you have to take on faith. This you can ask me later. But if I take any number a and raise it to the p minus 1th power, it will be 1 mod p. Do you understand what mod p means? OK, good. So this you have to take on faith right now. You can ask me later, no problems. So OK, silly, give me silly algorithms. It doesn't matter. How would we check if a number is prime? Great. Go through all numbers smaller than it and check if it's divisible by, by any of them. Slight improvement, you can you only go up to root n. Great. So that makes the question, well, then why is that not OK? That's great, right? So the question that I want to ask, if I want to check if p is prime, number of steps should be polynomial in the description of p. p for me to describe p to you, I only need to write the digits. Right? That is log p size. So I want to test in polynomial number of steps in this number of digits. Does that make sense? So I want to check if the number is prime, not in the size of, polynomial in size of the prime. I want to check in polynomial in this description of the prime. The description is just number of digits I need to write. So it should be polynomial in the number of digits. Does that make sense? Steps should be poly in number of digits. When I say step, uh, step think of as just like addition or multiplication. Addition, multiplication, these things, or like picking a random thing, these things you can do easily. But okay, we have some algorithm. Now, what do I do? This thing is not working, quite working, unfortunately, because there are things that are there other than primes, which also have this property. Okay. So what you ask is, if a square, if I tell you a square is congruent to 1 mod p, how many solutions does this have? Two. Yeah. But let's say I had p q. How many solutions does this have now? The no so what happens is, this number, if I want to square it and check its value mod pq, I can check its value mod p, and then I can check its value mod q. Does that make sense? So a root of this, a is 1 comma 1 will work mod p and q. And we know minus 1 comma minus 1 also works. But if I'm just squaring, then 1 comma minus 1 will also work. And minus 1 comma 1 will also work. Does that make sense? And I, I, so if these p and q are different primes, you can find such things. That again, you can take on faith. Does that make sense? Great. So this I could replace with any composite number that is not a power of a prime. OK? So what I will deal if I have some number that is not a power of a prime, I can break it into two factors, which are just a second, co-prime. And then you have these solutions to this equation. Does that make sense? OK, tell me. Great, yes. Yes, but it could be, they could be just any two numbers which are co-prime. For example, this again, you should, you will have to take on faith. So if I have numbers mod 15, okay, and I take numbers mod 3, comma mod 5. So there are 15 numbers here, and there are 15 numbers here. 
every number here has a description here yes but if two numbers here have the same description then their difference will be 0 comma 0 right that means that difference will be divisible by 3 and by 5 so that disc the number will have to be 0 that's the argument so any number here has a unique description here the mod p mod n1 n2 every number has a descript unique description mod n1 mod n2 good good so our idea is just this if it's a prime it has more root if it has only two roots if it's not a prime it has more roots so now you wonder what is your algorithm what is all this nonsense so my algorithm is i take n and here i want to exponent i put want to put n minus 1 right so i write n minus 1 is equal to 2 to the k into m okay i can keep dividing by 2 until i get an odd number n is the number i want to check if it's prime sorry given n yeah so n minus 1 is 2 to the k into m hmm? okay so what i usually have is a to the n minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p that was your idea take a random a and check the power mm -hmm. what i will instead do i'll pick a random a i'll first raise it to the kth power okay sorry mth power a to the m is some number okay then i square it square i get a to the 2m and i keep going if I never hit one, great. Definitely not a prime. That means I hit one. Okay. Now if I hit one, yes, after this I just square. I should hit one, right? Eventually, if it's a prime. If it's not, if I don't hit one, then I know it's not a prime. Yeah, but it, like it might. No, no. I'm saying, if it does not hit one, it is definitely not a prime. That's all I've said. Okay. So it hits one. So I see what the previous thing just before the one was. If it's a prime, it will. I. It has to be my minus one. If it's not a prime, with equal probability, you can show that there is some probability that it will be one of the other things. That I am not going to analyze for shortness of time. I just want to explain the algorithm. And then you can think about how it works. Algorithm is take a uniformly random n, a, from 1 to n, raise it to the mth power, keep squaring. If you hit 1 eventually at kth power, great. If you don't, then you're just done. If you hit one now, check what the previous thing was. Hmm? If it's a minus one, I declare prime. If it's not minus one, not a prime. And I'll declare a prime faultily. Uh, like I'll declare a composite number prime with some probability and that you can show is let, let's say less than half. That's it, that's the algorithm. And you can repeat this algorithm and it will, that's it. That's all you have to do. Mm -hmm. So I said, uh, you take uniformly random A, raise it to mth power. Then you keep squaring. You don't hit one, done, right? If you don't hit one, then it's composite. You know it's composite. If it hits one, then you just check the previous thing. What did I square? to get one. 
if it was prime, it must have been minus one. What I squared. Does that make sense? Because for a prime, the only solution a square is equal to one means a minus one into a plus one is divisible by p. It has to be minus one or one. But I'm looking at the first time I hit one. So it has to be minus one. Right? But for the other situations, when it's not a prime, then you can show that there is a very good probability that this number will not be minus one if I picked a uniformly for random first number. That's my entire algorithm. Mm -hmm. No, like they're very infrequent, but you want to judge if a, any number I give you, your randomness should not depend on what number I give you. Like your guarantees have to be independent. See, then I can fool you, right? I shouldn't be able to give you a random number and pretend it's a prime and you believe me. You have to be sure in for every number I give you, you have to be 99% sure. Does that make sense? Or like whatever guarantee you want. So this algorithm will be independent of the number. Like if you give me weirder numbers, it, it gets better for me. If you give me more factors, the probability that it's some other way of getting to minus one increases. That's it. That's the algorithm. Okay. I only have 10 minutes left. So I'll stop with this and take questions. About general things. I don't know. Other random things or I promise some a different type of probability and some bounds, but I decided that might get boring for some people. So decided not to do that. Yeah. So this is called Miller Rabin primality testing and it's Miller Rabin. Miller Rabin prime. And it's the two different people. One of the nice algorithms this is actually used. We know that primality you can actually check in polynomial time without randomness, but the algorithm there is horrible. Like it's a wonderful algorithm. The running time is horrible. No. So there you actually have like the best, like when the algorithm came out, it was like some power 20 or power 12. It was some horrible number, but now it has been improved all the way down to six, I think, or something like that, but with horrible constants, nobody ever uses it. Nobody will ever use it, but you have to do randomized kind of things because otherwise you, it's just too many steps N to the six N to the five. You can't run that in practice. Depends on the, mo then you have to be very precise about what model you're using and that kind of thing. And you never want actually do that. Does that make sense? Like what is computation? So then you can start, okay, this many arithmetic operations you're allowed, but even that's a very vague territory. So I think the constant people don't usually worry too much about. Huh? Yeah. Like usually it isn't for any problem that we care about and showing lower bounds is just generally very, very, very hard of any kind problems we suspect should not be solvable in polynomial time. We are not even able to show quadratic lower bounds most of the time. Showing lower bounds is just hard. Yeah.
primary testing you uh, use this in real life all the time like if you want to check if a number is prime this is what you use good question but see the last time we did this let's say my probability of failure is 10 percent yeah or let's say it's 50 percent i fail half the time then if i run my algorithm n times the probability i fail is one by two to the n that is very 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 small you can pick n to be a simply a large enough number that is that will mean that it will like you can easily make this number larger than the number of i don't know, atoms in the universe without having too much trouble so the probability of failure you can make very 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 small and it's something you are mostly okay with and you have to rely on that like you step out in your car, car or travel every day right you can get better <laughs> probabilities than that is how we deal with it does that make sense like because the probability that of failure that way can be argued can come from anything your system not working perfectly fine there being some random bit flip which you didn't account which you couldn't have accounted for so some probability of failure we are okay with it typically but we want guarantees this is the probability of failure yeah Yes. Yes. The... No. Okay. No, no, no. That is a factoring algorithm. If your if, 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 if you are actually able to reach one. For most numbers, you won't reach one with this because your initial guess is uh, exactly for this is not factoring because for most 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 numbers a to the n minus one is not one as per yeah which gives you nothing yeah it's Quite unfortunate. Unfortunately, we don't know how to factor numbers. <laughs> or fortunately, because that is how you guys live your life. If we knew how to factor numbers, then all of your phone security is dead or everything is gone. So on that note, we don't actually know that factoring numbers is hard. We just think so. <laughs> and all your security is based on that. And don't worry, that is far enough into the future. And there is post-quantum cryptography, don't worry. <laughs> like people are working on post-quantum cryptography. That might come before quantum computers, hopefully. <laughs> what? What? No, no, don't worry. She is not creating quantum computers. She is. <laughs> Probably will just tell you what quantum computation means. Don't worry. Yeah. Any other thing? Yeah. Qu computing with qubits. That's Prabha's talk. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Okay, great. Thanks for attending. <laughs>